the sermon this morning. Let's try that again. The sermon this morning is on the more serious side, and I wrestled with how to begin it, and I decided to begin in this way. The beginning of the sermon, the first minute or two, contains an image that is disturbing, although I'm not going to describe anything graphic, but I thought it would be appropriate to let you know. I want to describe a photograph that haunts me. It is a photograph of 13 people, a mix of men and women. They're all adults, but they're on the youthful side, it seems, probably in their 20s, though maybe it may be harder to judge their age exactly. They are all smiling, perhaps laughing, like there's some joke that has just been told amongst them. They're standing closely. Some have their arms around the others affectionately. They are posing for this photograph, posing on a small wooden bridge over a stream with woods behind them. You can imagine from this photograph that they might have just enjoyed a picnic together. This photo is found in a collection held by the United States National Holocaust Museum in Washington. The 13 young men and women in the photo are guards and officers at Auschwitz, away for a weekend outing. The photo was taken in the fall of 1944. As Judith Cohen, the museum's director of the photography collection, explains, this photo contains nothing abhorrent, and that is precisely what makes it so, so horrible. The great political philosopher Hannah Arendt spoke of the banality of evil, a commonly used phrase whose true meaning is chilling. Because when we speak of the banality of evil, what we are really saying is that evil is not some aberration from the order of the world, but that evil is located within familiar structures of everyday society. This idea stands in contrast to the idea that evil is some aberration, some exception from the normal world, which is a much more comforting idea. We could imagine a group photo of aberrant individuals, Charles Manson, Timothy McVeigh, Ted Kaczynski, Osama bin Laden. And we can imagine this group, we can easily imagine this group as evil because it's easy to locate evil in figures who stand outside or away from civilized society. These figures represent anti-civilization. But it's that photo, that photo of those 13 smiling young people, 13 young people who participated directly in the mass murder of one million Jews at Auschwitz, that is the face of an evil that is both exponentially deadlier and scarier, an evil that is banal. Bill Schultz, after serving as the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, went on to work as the executive director of Amnesty International, the world's most esteemed human rights organization. In his capacity serving as their executive director, he traveled the world, meeting both victims as well as perpetrators of torture. Reflecting on a dozen years as the head of Amnesty, Schultz wrote, who are torturers? Are they madmen, deviants, hardened criminals? Almost never, it turns out. In fact, most police and military units weed out the psychological misfits from their midst because they know that such people have trouble taking orders. No, Schultz says, the horrible truth is that the vast majority of torturers are average Joes and occasionally average Janes. And that's why, that's why that photograph is so haunting to me, why its lack of abhorrence makes it so horrible. It denies us the easy comfort of thinking that evil is somehow foreign or somehow rare. Those people 
can be our neighbors, our fellow citizens, a part of our society. And that is the banality of evil. What my sermon this morning is really about is civility. Civility is a word that's used quite a bit these days. It's common to hear people decry a lack of civility. It's common for people to say that civility is something to which we ought to all aspire. It's common for people to conjure up an age that was supposedly more civil than this one. But what I want to do this morning in my sermon is I want to challenge and interrogate that idea of civility. I want to ask what civility is and what it is not. If we believe, if we believe that evil is primarily, if we believe that evil is primarily encountered in anti-civilization, then we should hold on to civility at all costs. However, if we believe that evil is banal, then I would argue we should be suspicious, suspicious of those who try to define civility for us. So what is civility and what is it not? Civility, first of all, to me, seems to be not the same thing as manners or politeness. I had the opportunity one time to sit down with Bill Schultz, the former head of Amnesty International, we were in Phoenix, Arizona, and I asked him to have a beer with me. Earlier that same day, Bill had traveled to Sheriff Joe Arpaio's infamous tent city and met one of our nation's worst human rights violators. I asked Bill, I asked Bill, in your experience, how does Sheriff Arpaio compare to others? who you've met who have presided over torture. And I remember what Bill told me. He said, Arpaio is the exception. Unlike every other person responsible for torture I have ever met in all my years, the difference is that Arpaio is actually proud of what he does and wants the world to see it. But every other torturer I've met has tried to hide it. In fact, every other torturer I've met has turned on the charm, has tried to seem likable. Every other torturer has pretended at civility. Civility is often linked to education and culture, but civility, in fact, has nothing to do with education or culture. Those European colonizers, the British, the French, the Dutch, and so on, saw themselves as bringing civilization to the rest of the world, but we know that the murder and theft the colonizers perpetrated was in fact the very antithesis of civility. Civility is not the same thing as honor or decorum. I think of that famous Wilfred Owen poem, Dulce et decorum est. Who's familiar with that, with that poem? A few people. Well, the line is, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which in Latin means it is sweet and honorable to die for one's country. The poem takes us back to the First World War and to um, gas warfare. Wilfred Owen writes, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Wilfred Owen's poem makes a powerful accusation against what is often called honor, decorum, and civility. In the news this week, we've learned a lot about the culture in which the nominee for the Supreme Court grew up in. The extreme wealth and privilege in Bethesda, Maryland, an exclusive private academy, the most exclusive fraternity at Yale. And we've seen, we've seen the ways in which honor and loyalty, appeals to honor and loyalty and decorum are used to cover up abuse and shield predators. 
I want to pause right here for a moment. I did it in the first service, and that was my mistake. I want to pause for a word. I want to briefly address the anger, the justified and righteous anger that so many in this room and so many in our world are experiencing right now. I want to say, I believe you. And I want to say that in this, we see the contrast between that negative piece that King spoke about, a negative piece in which there's the absence of tension, and there's just everybody silent, and there really is no tension at all, and a positive piece which is the presence of justice, and the way towards that positive piece, as King wrote, as we know, is to not accept a negative piece, to create tension, to move the world towards greater justice. So civility is not a matter of honor or decorum or education or manners. It's not even a matter of adhering to laws and norms. Martin Luther King wrote, any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. We should never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. And everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. Civility is not manners, not education, not culture, not honor, not decorum, <coughs> not norms, and not laws. Esteemed public intellectual Lori Penny takes it one step further. She believes that civility is a tool used by the powerful to safeguard themselves and insulate themselves from challenges to the power they wield. She writes, the idea that politeness and civility is owed to anyone in a position of power is one of the great mistakes of liberal thought. If that claim seems striking to you, you might think and realize that it's the very same thing that King says in his letter from a Birmingham jail. In 1963, King went to Birmingham to lead protests and direct action as part of a campaign to put pressure on the city to desegregate. He was arrested in Birmingham for marching without a permit. And in response, he wrote a letter addressed primarily to white religious leaders in the city who were opposed to the marches and opposed to the civil disobedience. Those civic and religious leaders accused King of lacking civility, of stirring things up. They called him an extremist. King responds to his critics with these words. You say you deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and that does not grapple with underlying causes. It's unfortunate that the demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's power structure left us with no alternative. King says that his activism is not what is causing the tension in Birmingham. It is injustice that's causing that tension. All the protests are doing, he says, is revealing that this tension exists. There is one way and only one way to relieve this tension, King says, and that is justice. King says the protesters are not uncivilized, it's desegregation that's uncivilized, and if you want civility, create justice. There can be no civility without justice. If you want peace, create justice. There can be no peace without justice. If you want harmony, create justice, because there can be no true harmony without justice. What King is doing in his letter is setting up a highest principle, a highest value that must be the test and judge of all other values and all other principles. And for King, that highest principle is justice. To insist on, to praise, to esteem civility 
in the absence of justice is to make an idol of civility. And here is the difficult truth. Civility has never been found in the politics of the United States. Manners have, <coughs> honor has, decorum perhaps. People have gotten along with each other. They got along just fine in the 30s and 40s blocking federal anti-lynching legislation. But there has never been true civility, true justice. There have been times in our nation's politics where there has been a negative piece with the absence of tension and also the absence of justice, but there has never been a positive piece with the presence of justice. And so in Birmingham, civility, civility was found with the civil rights marchers just as civility was found amongst the drag queens at Stonewall, the nuclear freeze activists, the act up activists of the 1980s calling on the Reagan administration to even acknowledge AIDS. Similarly, civility in our day and age is found in the Me Too movement, the New Sanctuary movement, the indigenous water protectors, Black Lives Matters, and standing on the side of love. King wrote that we must not be content with a negative peace which is merely the absence of tension, but must work always towards a positive peace which is the presence of justice. I want to end this morning by bringing us back to that image I spoke of at the beginning of the sermon, that haunting, haunting photograph of 13 young, smiling people evidence of banality of evil. Here is what one author describes as what our response might be. He writes, the concept of the banality of evil touches on the sensitive nerve of the individual's moral responsibility to take a stand against society in any place and at any time, to confront conventions and cliches that pad the automatic processes of evil. Moral responsibility demands that the individual will go beyond the horizon of self-centered everyday life and not surrender to physical, emotional, or intellectual conveniences, to egoistic personal and group interests, to blind collaboration with society, to the pleasure of an uncritical sense of cohesiveness, to the enjoyment of belonging to the strong as such, to lies and to half-truths, to dumbness, to life's functionalities, and to justifying what exists. The banality of evil is an idea that demands that the individual think relentlessly, stand up against the world steamroller to which they are exposed, and take full responsibility for their judgments and their choices in a reality that is always tangled and complex. In a word, that each of us be human. It's perhaps an over-demanding reminder that one can never, should never, take a break from humanness. It is with that difficult challenge that I conclude. Amen. Thank you. And our closing hymn this morning is number 119, Once to Every Soul and Nation. And we're singing this hymn this morning by popular request. I uh, was standing in line, uh, in the reception line two weeks ago, and someone said, we should sing Once to Every Soul and Nation. And so here we go. It's that easy. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as we sing.